Let me start recording and welcome everybody and Rosemary on behalf of the South African TA Association. Welcome to our webinar for November. Over to you. Okay, so welcome everybody. Sorry, sorry. there's no recording. Normally there's a little red thing in the corner if it's recording and I, I can't see that, so I'm not sure it's started. Yeah, it has started. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, uh, somebody else is coming in, I can see. Um, so welcome everybody. And in a way what we were doing before we moved into the more formalized piece about recording was uh, exactly what we should have been doing anyway, which is finding out where people are coming in from. So um, if we could just complete that for my benefit but, and for the benefit of those people who are already there. Welcome Joanne, you've just come in. But just before you, Natalie came in, and you are where, Natalie? Where are you speaking from? Um, in Johannesburg. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm a member of the SATAA, and I've been doing TA for a number of years now. Um, with basically with Sharon Kalinko, who um, she's recently moved to London, but she used to be in Joburg. Um, yeah. yeah, and. Um, i um, busy doing a, a coaching course at the moment, um, so I have my exam in two weeks' time, and um, yeah, and I've got my honours in psychology. Hmm. Okay, and Johan, you've just come in, and you are where? I'm from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Okay, and do you and Natalie know each other? Uh, no. Okay, no. correct. Okay, it's good to know. And tell us about your connection with TA, Johan. Sorry? Tell us about your connection with TA. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, specialize with uh, corporate teams, work with corporate teams. And uh, TA is uh, mainly used in uh, the communication uh, sort of section of the process. So uh, we are I'm assisting or facilitating uh, executives to middle management level um, and communication is a particular module uh, that we uh, introduce them to TA. Okay. So are you in TA training with anybody or have you been in TA training with anybody yourself? Well, I went to uh, a series of uh, training sessions with Sharon Kalenko. Okay, great. Okay. And um, Rosemary, did you want to add anything about you and the TA that you are learning? Yes, sure. Why not? Uh, I've been uh, with TA for the last two and a half years now. And, uh, and uh, I use TA in the corporate trainings that I do. I even take TA to colleges and school and present uh, ideas from TA. And I train uh, with Dr. Susan George in Chennai. Okay. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Correct. And Inga, you didn't get to say about you. I've been training um, in TA the last four, four and a half, five years. I can't even remember with Rosemary, so I'm with you. Um, and currently, I mainly use it in lecturing. That's why I'm here in Osnabrück at the moment, because I'm lecturing at the University of Applied Sciences. I'm lecturing human resource management and international human resource management. Mm. And I'm an intercultural trainer, so for me, I always link TA to all the intercultural aspects. Yeah. So really, Inga should probably be running this. Um, <laughs> what I... What I'm curious about is what do you want to know about me? So this is an opportunity just for a few minutes. Check with your parent ego state, your structural parent ego state. Johan, you've got somebody else in the background there. Um, Barbara, you can just say hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Check with your parent ego state, all those interjects who are saying, who's she, what's this all about, or whatever else they're saying and check out what questions your parent ego state might have for me. Um, usually in my experience, the parent ego state really wants to check that I'm credible in some way. And check out your structural child ego state. 
What connections do you want to make? What are you curious about what we've got in common? In my experience, the child ego state is often very questioning or, or wanting to know about commonality in some way and maybe silenced by the parent ego state in that internal dialogue between the structural parent and the structural child. So let's hear what either parent ego state needs to know for credibility reasons or any other reasons and what the child ego state wants to know for purely nosy or curious reasons. And um, make sure that you haven't got any dialogue in the way whilst so we can continue. So over to you. Um, I think I have something what I need to say because I'm sitting here and I'm still eating because I just came home from lecturing and I'm starving. Uh, so I'm still eating a little bit because I'm very, very hungry. So I hope I'm finished with that soon. And it feels disturbing. So I just yeah, let you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you've already heard how most people have just had dinner. So, yeah. Okay. So, any parent ego states there? There should be 27 of them, probably at least between us. Maybe more. I have a question, Rosemary. Yep. I'd like to know how you found uh, TA accepted by your clients. Um, okay, so I work with organizations and with individuals. And um, I don't talk about TA. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's yeah. good enough. Okay. Yeah. So when I have an organizational client, my job is to learn to speak the language of the organization, not to teach them a new language. Mm. Yeah, I know how difficult it is to learn languages. So I'm, you know, sometimes there will be some concepts from TA, but I may well use other concepts or whatever they're already using or mm. speaking. And I tend not to work so much in that cognitive way unless I'm delivering training. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. TA for me is what I use to train consultants and coaches and trainers and facilitators um, so that there is an underpinning coherent theoretical base around their interventions and they've got ways to think about themselves and think about what's going on. Yeah. But clients aren't usually very interested. They don't care. They just want whatever it is they say they want which may not be what they do want, if you see what I mean. Okay. What do you oh, think? Nice question. <laughs> yeah, go on. Hello. Um, and that is, how, what, what brought you to this intercultural topic? Was, was that something personal experience, serenity? Uh -huh. what, yeah, what brought you to, to uh -huh. your topic that you're presenting today? Okay. Well, I'm a third culture kid. Does that mean anything to you, third culture kid? So third culture kid is somebody who might be brought up in a culture which is not their culture of origin, or might be somebody who has parents of different cultures to the place that they are brought up in, or parents that have different cultures from each other and many, many variations of third culture kid. And I was a kid who was brought up in a number of different countries during my school years. So I've always been very curious about culture in the sense of ethnic cultures, countries, that way of thinking about cultures. And then um, as I became interested in organizations and working with different organizations, I realized of course every organization has its own culture. And indeed, as we will see, as we look further, families have their own culture too. Um, and one of the things that I was really interested about, I, I trained originally in TA psychotherapy, and then I took a second training in organizational TA. 
and then I did educational TA and then eventually counselling TA. And what I realised um, as I've developed my TA learning and teaching is my understanding of personality is that actually we are primarily shaped by cultural influences and the uh, simplistic ideas that, you know, it's mum and dad and that's it, uh, or mum and dad and grandparents and that's it, is, is really simplistic. Um, and I was very pleased to come across a quote uh, this last week, which was that some professor of social science so, a neuroscience saying that he thought that personality was 90% culturally shaped. And I think I, I'm, you know, that's pretty radical, 90%. But I reckon, yeah, we are hugely shaped by past and current cultures. And it's very, very overlooked these days, mainly, I think, because of the influence on psychology from the United States and the ink influence on almost everything from the United States, which may not be so strong for, for you in India, although I am aware from visiting India a lot in the last 15 years that the influence has really accelerated. And I don't know how that influence of the United States culture is for you in South Africa, but with the English language, I imagine it's quite strong. And we are really living in the time of narcissism. Um, very, very strong focus on the individual. And I'm fascinated how in organisations now immediately the question, if something goes wrong, is who is to blame? And very often problems inside organisations are systemic. And that may be true of nations as well, that it's much more systemic um, in terms of difficulties and problems but I think it's a very useful way of thinking about personality. So I'm a bit of a, I feel I'm a bit of a lone voice in the TA world. I'm not the only one, but quite a lone voice saying, hang on a minute, especially if you're psychotherapy TA, maybe there is much, much more to it than this. How does that sit with you, Lau? Those Great, thoughts? thank you. I think, yeah, you've, you've um, yeah, fed my my curiosity and the search for commonality, I think, too. Yeah, so, yeah, great. I'm a third culture kid. Good. <laughs> and yeah, happy. Okay. As an educator, I like to be fairly provocative mm -hmm. um, because I think that disturbs people's frames of reference. And I think that's how we learn is to mm -hmm. be a little disturbed, a little shaken up. So please be disturbed a bit if you're willing, or be willing yeah. to be disturbed at least. Okay. This might be old hat. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions or thoughts for me out there? How does those how do those comments sit with you and your beliefs and ideas? Can I ask some of you who've not spoken yet? Um, I can add a, th a thought, Rosemary. Um, yeah. So um, in, in my work in, in South Africa, I work a lot in government and I have done since um, the early 2000s where the main kind of project in South Africa has been around transforming the, the state into a democratic one. And that, that's not going to take, you know, two years. It's 20 years on and we're still struggling. Um, but most of my work has been with clients who are from traditional African cultures. And then there's also in South Africa um, a large um, uh, group of, of, of people from Indian descent. And then there's a large group of people who were always called under apartheid coloreds, but and they have a very varied ancestry from Malay slaves to all sorts of other um, uh, influences. And all of those cultures, um, and then in South Africa, sorry, we also get, we have also got pockets of Portuguese culture, Italian culture, and all of the cultures that I've mentioned, including Afrikaans culture, 
um, is very collective rather than individualistic. And I was really fascinated in Erin Mayer's a book called The Culture Map. She's from the INSEAD yeah. Business School in France. And she makes a point in that book about how Protestant cultures are more individualistic than Catholic cultures. Yeah. And that got me thinking because white English-speaking South Africans are mainly Protestant and they're quite individualistic. So that's where the influence that connects to the United States influence comes in. But all of our other cultures are very collectivist. We have this concept of Ubuntu, which um, talks about, you know, I am as we are. So the definition of self is not an individualistic one at all. And it's been quite um, interesting for me how a lot of mainstream consulting methodologies are so individualistic and do not sit well. In fact, actually jar and um, actually even get to the extent of insulting people when used insensitively. So I'm absolutely with you on this notion of being collectivist and carrying a consciousness that is affected by not only two parents, um, but everything that's happening around us. Yeah. And I think um, a couple of comments I'd like to make in response to what you say, Chantal. One is absolutely the collectivist idea um, is very different from the individualistic idea, which is coming from the United States to Europe. So Europe is more collectivist than the United States, but even so, um, I think that one of the things that's, that's been happening here is the media, the shift in media, uh, in all sorts of ways from movies and the whole global media business is this acceleration and the acceleration tends to be from the dominance of the individualistic cultures. So it's beginning perhaps to impact on some of the collective cultures um, in, in both ways which may be positive and ways which are not. I was quite shocked at um, India, how when I first came to India 15, 20 years ago, things like TA and one-to-one -one work were very unusual. And then with the rise of call centers being based in India and then the stress and then the breakdown in family relationships that came from the stress of working night shifts in the call centers to suit American times, people were beginning to ask for one-to-one -one support, which, you know, is, is such a challenge in a culture, in a whole complex culture where the collective and the family are so key. So the other piece I wanted to say, and this, this may be deeply provocative, um, the Greeks thought that democracy was not the best form of government. And the Greeks may have been right. It may not be the best form. One person, one vote, the idea of democracy. It may not be the best way. And I was working with a group of women from various African countries uh, two weeks ago. Um, and we were talking about how in the African countries, the culture uh, that seems to have developed of having people as prime ministers for a long term and staying and changing the law so that they can stay in power really relates to um, the notion of the tribes and the chiefs, but that traditionally chiefs would tend at around about the age of 55 to step down and become an elder, to become a wise person and an advisor, and that this doesn't exist anymore as a place within this form of democracy that's been imposed by the colonial rule from 50, 60 years ago. So it may not be the best form of government for your countries. That might be a provocative comment in itself, and I don't know about that, but, um, it may be that there are other ways that we need to be thinking about and be influenced by in all sorts of settings. So I want to be really clear that the idea of intercultural here is that it is inter. 
it is in all directions there are influences going in all ways and often i pick up an idea from some of the literature and i certainly pick up an ideas from looking at ta literature which is this is the way and so it's a one direction not two directions so i would love to see a lot more theory coming out of india for example um, I was with Saru and I wrote an article about that in the TAJ about at least 10 years ago now to say, come on, <laughs> let's have more ideas, influence this Western form of TA, which is so dominating. So, Rosemary, you look young enough that you could be a future TA theorist and, and wise enough that you could chuck in your tuppence worth. So. I do surely do hope so. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so any other thoughts for me, questions for me before I ask you what exactly you want to be taking away? Okay, so what do you want to be going away with in an hour and a half's time? Um, if I could hear from the people who haven't spoken yet, if we could start with them and I can that way tell you whether it's on the agenda or not, whether it's likely or not. So, Kirsty, how about you? Um, I missed a bit there because my... I know, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was really just intrigued uh, by the whole idea of the cultural side of TA. I've never really learned much about that. So I, I don't have a specific takeaway in mind. I've just got an open, curious and happy to see what comes up. Okay, so I'd like to check with you at the end whether you feel your mind has shifted a little bit in terms of TA and intercultural work. Yeah. Natalie? Um, I share your interest in um, systems theory, basically looking at things in terms of a system as opposed to the individual parts. Because I think as long as you're focusing on the individual, you're missing the entire context around that. Um, so you can never really get a get the full picture. Um, and I was just reflecting a bit on what you were saying about um, people being so um, affected by culture. And I was thinking about this culture of the individual and promoting the individual. Um, and in some of the material that I'm learning about in coaching, you know, it speaks about transcendence and um, in, in order to attain transcendence. Yeah, transcend, about, transcend, transcend. So it's about... So it's um, about um, it's not about sacrifice. There's a very bad echo when I speak. <laughs> okay, it seems to be resolved. Um, so, sorry, getting back to that, um, when I was learning about transcendence, it's, it's not about sacrificing yourself for the collective, but it's about like learning to love yourself so that through that you're then available to reach out to others and, and thereby connect to other people and to the rest of the world. So it just, it just interested me um, the way yeah, it's, it's sort of provoked those, those kind of thoughts. And I'm, I'm just curious to, to learn new perspectives and just interested to learn more. We don't hear you, Rosemary. You're, you're muted. Thanks. I will um, certainly show you a systems model within TA, and um, I will be working with the idea that that the person that you can make a difference with internally is yourself, and that we have to start there. Yeah. Okay. Can I hear from somebody else, Johan? What do you want to be taking? Well, it's it's really, uh, I wouldn't say it's very uh, specific. It's more of a, 
I would say, a general interest in uh, the, the role of TA within uh, corporate cultures. Um, because I oftentimes experience um, uh, you, uh, you go into a certain direction with TA. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking within the context of communication. Uh, and, and then uh, it's almost like a bolt of lightning uh, from the CEO uh, comes along and um, just screws up everything. Uh, and then you're back to square one again. So it is, it's almost like a rat in a treadmill syndrome that I see with, with a lot of companies. Uh, they start off very excited, very, very keen, and we go along very nicely. But then at some point, uh, a, a very different culture rears its head and uh, and because of, I suppose, the, the fear factor, um, a lot of people uh, sort of comply and they uh, follow the rules of the game uh, to stay in a job, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of, a lot of um, negatives come out of that uh, and it affects the company, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. negatively, but you know, that's not very easily admitted. Yeah, so it's, it's really a case of uh, general interest uh, to perhaps pick up some uh, ideas and thoughts in terms of how to overcome or perhaps counteract uh, or to um, inculcate a certain, a certain way of thinking and behaving. Okay, so um, Johan, the way I work there, and you'll get a glimpse of this, but only a glimpse, because I think um, we're focusing on intercultural here, but the way I work there is I do get an organization and you have to have a contract with the CEO to do this with the CEO to examine their own culture. So I, before you can work in dynamic with dynamics or other bits of an organization, I think the organization has to examine its own culture. I'll touch on that very briefly. Okay. Rosemary. Um, yeah, having been brought up uh, in various parts of India in itself and experienced all the cultures that I have been exposed to and the stories that I have been told in the various cultures that I have been exposed to. And recently I came across uh, a research paper that said, um, depending on the individualism and the collectivism of a society, even the insults that are set out to people differ um, as against calling you a stupid uh, uh, in a collectivist society it may uh, it may be something like you're stupid and so is your family so the differences in insults and small things like humor the differences are so pronounced but even then there is this element of commonality and i'm now curious to understand or explore or Think about ideas, how TA can use this commonality thread and get through and, you know, spread uh, that or increase that commonality that is already there, despite the differences. You're muted, uh, Rosemary. Chantal, thank you, Rosemary. Chantal? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> what do you want to take away? Um, I, I think for me, my intention is just to sit and, uh, as I said earlier, take in from a different body of theory. And I'm getting that already. I'm just really bathing, if you like, in the, in the different languages and, and, and concepts and, and, and playing with them. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And um, so I'll for the ask other and what's key of those. Sure, sure. I do have one want, and that is for the other Rosemary, a copy of that article about the insults. So I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anand, how about you? For me, again, to expand my uh, horizon, how to be more present 
uh, in my own culture. I've been away, uh, just to update you, I've been away for nearly 38 years in Canada and I've re recently returned back. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have not seen what you had mentioned about what happened in India, just heard about it and, and I'm experiencing that cultural impact that's happening, happening in India. So now looking at my second career entering in, I just want to have a better understanding of uh, the individualistic and the collective approach and how to understand the nuances and, and yeah. be more present to myself and to the other people, whether it's jokes or sarcasm or the humor or whatever that is there uh, to have a better understanding to. Okay. So Rosemary, we all want your paper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Leo, how about for you? Um, well, I, I think, well, I believe that my life's purpose is to build bridges between worlds that maybe are not really separate, but seem to be separate. And I'm always interested in getting new ideas for how to do that. Okay. All right. I've got one for you in a minute. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Inga, how about for you? I'm very intrigued about um, talking about this intercultural aspect, NTA, even this really international group. So it's not, not, I wouldn't call it intercultural, it's an international group and really get the different perspectives which we all have and see what comes out of it. And yeah, well, I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay. Alex, anything you want? I know you're here as the moderator and coordinator, but you might have things that you want. Um, no, I think it's been covered by what everyone else is after as well. Thank you. Okay. So I'll check with you at the end. And in the meantime, what I'd like to do right now is, did you all get the message about you need a sheet of paper? Yes. Can you take your sheet of paper and tear a hole in it? Tear a hole in your sheet of paper. Everybody done that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what I'd like you to do now is to hold the sheet of paper up about 10 centimeters or six inches in front of your nose and look at your screen. 10 inches or uh, 10 centimeters or six inches. Okay. So <coughs> the notion here is that this is our frame of reference. Classic TA concept. And our TA rep, our frame of reference will limit us from seeing as much as there is to see. And that this frame of reference is built up from many, 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 many aspects. And I'm going to take you through an activity in a moment which looks at those various aspects. But before going there, let's take a look at what is a frame of reference in TA. And Alex has got something which he'll put on the screen that hopefully we can all see and I will talk too. Because there is a very specific meaning in TA. I will share that now. So each individual's overall, and if you can see me, yeah, this is my overall perceptual framework and conceptual framework. So the meanings I make, the ideas I have are very much limited and shaped by the concepts that are part of my frame of reference and affective. 
So my emotional responses are governed by my frame of reference. What I find insulting and might get angry about, thinking of what Rosemary said earlier, is going to be different from what you might, each person here, feel angry about. Um, that is shaped by my frame of reference, by many, many aspects which will impact on this and which are another way of putting it is our structural ego states and thus my behaviors so for me there is no point in looking at behaviors ta is very focused in some areas and looking at behaviors if we're not also looking at what lies behind the behaviors so our emotions our concepts our cognitive capacities our perceptions, what do we actually see, what do we notice. And it's all of that which I use and I bring to defining myself, to defining other people, and to how I see the world, both structurally and dynamically. And structurally and dynamically, it is the interplay between structures and dynamics that Eric Byrne described as creating culture. So in any context, any situation we're in, whether it's a family and we're looking at a family culture, whether as Johan was talking about, it's an organization, we're looking at an organizational culture, whether we're thinking about a, na a nation, and looking at the national culture, it is the structures within that family or that organization or that society shaping and limiting the dynamics and the dynamics impacting and shaping the structures. And as we weave through that, you get something which looks like an infinity sign. And this is what Eric Byrne really described as culture emerging out of this interplay of the structures and dynamics. And the culture itself, as we'll see later, cannot be um, grasped. Culture is um, smelt, perhaps, tasted, felt, expressed through metaphor, but we can't really touch it. We can't really describe it. We can describe the structures and we can describe the dynamics, but we can't really get there for the culture itself. And Alex, I'd like to put a, a picture up on the screen. Okay, so to do that, I go to what do I, where do I need to go? So if you put your cursor on the bottom of your screen, you'll see an option saying share screen. It's a box with an up arrow. Got in, that. In the middle, and then you'll be able to select your screen. Okay, so, so here's, did that come up? Yeah. Okay. So it hasn't come up on mine, but <laughs> It's fine. If it's come up in yours, that's great. Okay, so here we've got Burns' um, idea from his Structures and Dynamics book in TA. And what I'm really doing here is suggesting that this um, is the DNA of culture and very slow to change. So I was thinking about that, that fear-based organizational culture that Johan talked about just now, that that's probably been part of the culture, um, the morale in that organization for a very long time. And whilst things will have changed, and Chantal, you were talking about working with government agencies, that whilst 25 years has passed or more since big changes in South Africa, those cultures from the past are very slow to change. So this invisible felt smelt aspect of culture takes a long time. 
to shift. And I think that's something for us to really bear in mind that whilst there may be seemingly different structures or shifts in the etiquette, in the dynamics, and often trainers go into organizations, particularly to work on the dynamics and re-engineers go in to work on the structures. Unless we are working on both the structures and dynamics at the same time with a long-term plan, there will be no shift in the culture of an organization or a group or a nation. So it takes a long time and very consistent interventions on both parts in order to change a culture. But we can't change a culture to something that we would ideally like it to be. It will change, it will evolve fairly naturally. And certainly interventions in the dynamics and interventions in the structures can help that change, but it's not gonna change very easily. I'd like to pick up with you a bit more, if you're willing, about the um, shift in this idea of um, culture and how it impacts our own frame of reference. Alex, what I'd like to do is go out of this particular sure. slide. So on the top of your screen, is a, it should be in red, it says uh, stop share. Yeah. And I'd like to call up the whiteboard and do a little bit of drawing and take you through this individually and then into rooms where you can then talk about it. Um, how do I get the whiteboard up? So you can go to share screen and whiteboard should be one of the options. Whiteboard, where are you whiteboard? Yep, got it. Okay. So. Um, okay, I'm going to draw, I hope. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to take you through the, an idea from Denton Roberts, who's a TA person, very active in the 80s and 90s, and who worked with community groups in the bad end of Los Angeles. He was a, a man of the church. And he was particularly interested in the cultures that he met. And he came up with an idea about cultures at the individual level, how culture really shapes our frame of reference, which I think is really interesting. And right in the middle, he thought the very first culture that happens or that in a sense he wanted to say we're born into, but maybe it's before we're born, is the culture of gender, male or female and whether what the messages are about male or female and that, that was a very early culture that we're impacted by with messages and as i go through Anton robert's ideas what i'd like you to do is just jot down for yourself any messages that you're aware of that impacted you in terms of gender so it may be that one gender is more precious than another. It may be that one gender is more wanted than another or more valuable than another. Whatever messages you, you're aware of, just go for that. And then we're born into a family culture. So this becomes the next ring on our individual tree, if you like, the family culture. And the family culture, we probably don't realize until we go to somebody else who's not related, go to somebody else's house when we're kids and realize that their family culture is different. And that might happen at any time in our growing up or even quite late in our lives. And even now going around to somebody else's family, their setting and seeing, being impacted by it being very different. And this, because the culture is so under our skin, this is, seems to be so often what happens. We don't recognize another culture. We don't recognize our own culture till we're in another culture. 
and then we realize oh oh I hadn't expected that or that seems different or whatever it is that we might say to ourselves that we realize we're in a different culture and our family culture will give us messages there'll be many 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 messages and just see if you pick up on one or two family culture messages that you might have come across and we're probably at a pretty young age we'll go to school that might be our first experience of a really different culture and certainly there's lots of stories that people tell of how somebody is very different when they're in the school culture from when they're in their family culture and just occasionally there might be somebody who meets the person in both cultures and then says whoa didn't expect whatever and our school cultures and probably we've all had several but our school culture is a uh, probably our first when we first go to school our first large groups out in the world may not be the very first but they're significant we spend a lot of time often in schools and Giles Barrow in TA reckons that it's probably one of the very few experiences that almost every individual on this planet has is going to school for a very few years at least that almost everybody goes to school sometime in their growing up for a small amount of time at least so there'll be the school culture and any key messages about how to be in the world or cultural messages of any sorts and the other large larger group situation we may have come across from very young will be religion if there was a religion that we were born into there may be a religious culture and that might have some very clear messages about how to be in the world it may have messages about other people so the religious culture and then maybe we'll be born into a, a rural context or an urban context or a village context Are there cultural messages that we carry that shape our frame of reference from those contexts? We may regard ourselves as belonging to a particular ethnic culture Chantel, you were describing in your work many different ethnic cultures that you came across. Do we see ourselves as belonging to a particular ethnic culture and what are the messages that we had and have? Because these messages may have changed over time about whatever the ethnic culture is that we were in some way told we were part of or came to realize that we were part of. And we could add, I think, many more layers here. I am have taking ideas from Denton Roberts. I've added one or two. And he would talk also about a national, a national culture. So... And, and I'm really interested in that you've been part of the Indian nation and then the Canadian nation and different messages you will have had in terms of those cultures along the way. So lots of different messages that we will have had from many different layers of culture 
which coexist and may be congruent or may have conflict between those messages. And we will have found a way to somehow resolve them. We will probably have found ways to emphasize particular cultural belongings and to perhaps minimize other cultural roots that we might have come from. What I'm going to invite you to do is to um, move into rooms, which Alex is going to put people in pairs, Alex, in a moment, um, to share what thoughts or ideas have come up for you as we went through that particular piece. And in particular, <coughs> what I want you to do is to stay um, okay with what you're talking about. So, you know, touch on the bits which are easiest for you to be talking about and sharing and inquiring about with your colleague that you're going to meet in another room. Um, keep yourself safe because there may be in your cultural origin some really difficult messages. So keep yourself to the sorts of messages that are possible in a 10 minute discussion to really unpick. And if you're happy to do that, then I'm going to ask you to go into this uh, rooms in pairs. We are three, six, eight, so perfect for pairs. And Alex will be setting that up 